Hello friends and fellow history buffs. Today we're going to do, who's we? I'm going to do a story on Paul of Tarsus from the Bible, the guy that had that road to Damascus conversion where Jesus kind of knocked him off his pedestal because he was going around. This is after Jesus had been crucified and died and rose to heaven and, and Paul's going around persecuting these Christians and his followers of him are, are um, getting too powerful and they're going to upset the apple cart. So Paul was going around, you know, killing them ordering them to be stoned to death. And he was on his way to Damascus, Syria, to have more of them killed when uh, he had that, that, that encounter with Christ. And Christ changed his name from Saul to Paul. Saul means big, and they changed his name to Paul, which means small. So, so here's this, um, so now, and then he leaves for three years, and then he starts reading the scripture, which he was already an expert on. But once the scales have been removed from your eyes, and you see everything, and you see what happened, and you put it all together, he was like, whoa, this was the Messiah. So he did those three famous missionary tours all around, you know, Anatolia, East Asia Minor, Turkey, uh, Greece, Rome, and, um, and spread the gospel. So I put him as the second greatest person who ever lived behind Jesus, which Wikipedia, and I differ on this, Wikipedia has Muhammad number one. Personally speaking, anybody who marries a nine-year-old doesn't get catapulted to number one in any category that I have, any list, you know. So I have Jesus number one, Paul who spread the gospel, number two. So uh, Paul was a Pharisee, a tent maker, you know, he, he worked for his money, which I got to give him a lot of credit. A lot of... Um, Pseudo intellectuals like to sit around and just talk. You know, they just like to talk and make money off of whatever comes out of their mouth. And <laughs> Paul, uh, you know, the Jews they call him Saul, but we're going to go with what Jesus called him, which was Paul. Um, Paul, um, he earned his money as well, so which he needed to make money because he traveled ten thousand miles in his in his journeys at least. And so and so I'm doing this because. Uh, because this guy went through a lot of hardship, a lot of trials, a lot of tribulations, and there's this misconception that Christians got it made, you know, this, it's all happy and, you know, financial wealth, and, you know, this. there's uh, Christians that teach about health and prosperity, health and wealth gospel, name it and claim it, and, and then there's reality, okay? <laughs> then there's reality, you know, we as Christians know that we suffer financial hardships, we suffer, you know, sicknesses, and, you know, we just keep our eyes on, on the Lord. And our sicknesses and our weaknesses, we're, we're really made stronger. In fact, the greatest sensation of love I've ever felt in my life was, was a day when I've had like three really bad, bad flus in my life. And maybe it was, um, maybe it was an influenza. I don't know what it was, but it was like three days in bed, super, super, super sick. And it was one of those times... Uh, where my wife and my daughter were nurturing me and I never felt so much love because I had such great appreciation for the care they were given to me and it was the greatest feeling I ever had. I wish I could just have that full time. And so uh, I like Paul number two because he spread this kind of love message around the world. He didn't, he didn't spread a gospel of killing people to convert. He spread a, a, a gospel of loving people and educating people and letting them make their own you know, mind-heart decision. So let's take a look into the life of Paul. So I'm going to start this off with a scripture from the book of Acts, chapter 22, verse 3. Uh, and it's Paul speaking. I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, which is Jerusalem. He's, I'm born in Tarsus, which is like the intellectual, the Greek, one of the Greek intellectual capitals of the world, but it was, had been about the time of his birth, uh, taken over by the Romans. But they still had that, you know, that, that secular educational um, a reputation of higher learning, kind of like the Harvard or the Yale or the Oxford of the day. So when he's saying, yeah, I'm from Tarsus, you know, they're saying, ooh, you know, and his dad, they know his dad was a Pharisee and, and educated under Gamaliel. Gamaliel was one of the greatest uh, educators at that time who still revered to this day, who had uh, his great grandfather started the his grandfather was Hillel the elder 
He was the, he founded the great Sanhedrin. He founded the house of Hillel and the school of Tanium, which is they're all, this is like where the, uh, the Talmud was being originally uh, written. Well, I think it was actually had the Talmudic period in Babylon. This is, I think, the, the Talmudic period uh, in Jerusalem. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right about that. But anyhow, the, the writings of, of Gamil's grandfather and his peers survive to this day. So now we have Paul. He's alive during this apostolic period, right? And, and spreading the gospel uh, uh, during that period. And he's given a rundown that, yeah, I'm from Tarsus. I'm a Jew from Tarsus, educated under Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our fathers. Uh, and I was zealous towards God as you are uh, today. This is, this is Paul speaking after he became a Christian. He's saying, I persecuted this way. You ever heard of Christianity called The Way? There was a Bible in the 70s called The Way. Uh, he persecuted the way to death, binding and delivering them into prisons, both men and women. Also, as the high priest bears me witness and all the council of elders from whom I also received letters to, this, to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there in Jerusalem to be punished. So this is how he's talking about how he used to go around gathering Christians uh, to be punished. And in fact, he's talking about while he was on his way to Damascus, he had that, that road uh, to Damascus conversion. So his education is at that time was kind of like, let's just say you're a conservative and you're being taught by John Locke and, and, and Edmund Burke and, and William F. Buckley. You know, you're being taught by the greatest minds of of the day. Uh, this is the type of education Paul had. Let me just continue talking briefly about the stock or the possible stock of uh, uh, Paul because, uh, excuse me, there are some uh, scholars who believe that Paul may have been related to Herod the Great, which would make you a pretty prominent Roman citizen. So we're going to go to uh, Romans chapter 16 where uh, Paul is, is saying, okay, greet so-and-so, greet Priscilla, greet uh, all these people that he knows there. And, you know, give them my love. And then he says down in verse 11, let me find it here real quick. Verse 11 of the NIV says, Greet Herodian, my fellow Jew. And there are people called Herodians who were Hellenistic Jews. But let me look at the King James Version. King James Bible, salute Herodian, my kinsman. So now we're talking about a relative, not like... A fellow group of relatives like a clan but a, a person by name greets Herodian uh, my kinsman so could that be Herod greet Herod the Great right my blood brother you know just throwing it out there that's something that's being uh, being uh, discussed by uh, scholars to this day so anyhow long and short Paul becomes a born-again Christian, right? A Christ follower, a believer that Yeshua was the Messiah, right? So he did not, he wasn't taught this. It was revealed to him by God. Look in uh, Galatians real quick, chapter 1, verse 12. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came to me through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Right? For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism and how I persecuted the church. Right? Let's follow it down, chapter 1 of Galatians, down to where he decides it's time to bounce. Right? When it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, right? He didn't go around saying, okay, Jesus, uh, I just met Jesus in this blinding light and, you know, let me go run to uh, the apostles and find out what this is all about. No, he didn't do that. He bailed, right? This is what he did. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then, after three years, so he went three years and opened up all these scrolls that he had already known, 
and he started reading Isaiah 53, and he started reading these prophetic scriptures about how he would be rejected, how he would be beaten, how he would come into town on a donkey. And, and then he knew all these things had actually happened. And he's like, yeah, this was the Messiah. So he, he left for three years. And then he went to Jerusalem, but just for two weeks, right? He saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. So, and then afterward, I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and he and, he, and Paul saying, I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but they were only hearing that he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God. So they didn't know Paul by face, they knew about him by reputation. He was gone for three years. He came back for a couple of weeks, 15 days, and then he bounced. He, he went to all these regions and probably spent a lot of time in Antioch, uh, which became like the, the cradle of Christianity. A lot of Jews converted, but a lot of Gentiles converted to Christianity. So like I said, he went to Arabia. Paul went to Damascus, and he came back for a few, and then he bounced to Asia Minor. So I'm not exactly sure the timeline of when somebody first tried to take his life, but in Damascus, there was an attempt on his life. And it could have been during that, that first three years where he was uh, studying scripture and he probably started talking to people about Jesus. And I'm sure with his level of education, with his reputation of who he was, he was able to convince a lot of people. And then when you start introducing a new you know, religion, uh, which it wasn't really a new religion. You know, the New Testament is really basically a fulfillment of the old. It's all one continuous uh, plan. Uh, this is what happened to Paul in uh, Damascus. In uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verse, let's, start with verse, uh, let's start with verse 30. If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity which is kind of the genesis of why I'm doing this. You know, his sicknesses, his illness. You know, look, go back to 29. Who is weak? Am I not weak? Who is made to stumble? And do I not burn with indignation? If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under Aratus, the king, was guarding the city of Damascus, uh, Essenes, with a garrison desiring to arrest me, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. So they were going to kill him. So he, got, he escaped Damascus. You know, he came to Jerusalem, spent a couple of weeks there, and that's when he went out and he first started to really spread the gospel, the gospel to uh, Jews and Gentiles. So we're going to read from the book of Acts, chapter 21, is it? A about when Paul comes back to Jerusalem and he gets arrested and you're going to see uh, how he is treated. So uh, he gets noticed, right? And somebody cries out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and the place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. But they, they, they thought that he had brought uh, a Greek into the temple, right? So um, all the city was disturbed, and the people ran towards, uh, ran together, and they seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Now, as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and asked who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitudes cried out one thing and some cried out another. Long story short, they were saying, away with him, away with him. So the commander kind of pulled Paul aside just to get him away and wanted to talk to Paul to find out what the heck was going on. And uh, so Paul says to the uh, centurion, um, May I speak with you? And he said, yeah. Can you speak Greek? He goes, are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led 4,000 people of assassins uh, in, uh, into the wilderness? And Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus. 
a citizen of no mean city, and I implore you to permit me to speak to the people. So they, so the centurion thought that the it was just a, a matter of, of of misunderstanding on who he was. The people knew who he was. The centurion was just you know trying to trying to get to the bottom of it. So Paul's like, let me speak to these people. So Paul stood up, and a great silence came upon the people. And I'm not going to read you everything what he said because it's a you know now we're jumping into chapter 22. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they all kept quiet. I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus, brought up in a city, at the feet of Gamaliel, right? So he's explaining all he was. He's explaining how he was on the road to Damascus and that how he was called to uh, witness and he goes all the way down to verse 21. And he said to me, depart, for I will send you afar from here to the Gentiles. Now, now they understand that he's saying, yeah, I I'm, I'm, was sent by the Messiah to go preach our gospel message to the Gentiles, which they think is a misappropriation of their scriptures, okay? So that was it. That's when they start tearing their clothes, right? So they listened to him until this word and they, they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. Then as they cried out and tore their clothes and threw dust in the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks so that he could be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. And, and so they bound him with thongs. Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? So the centurion just remembered Paul saying, yeah, I'm a Jew, right? So basically they can do whatever they want to a Jew, but there are certain laws that, that, that they had to abide by uh, legally on how to deal with the Roman citizen. You couldn't just bind a Roman citizen without proper cause, right? So uh, when the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, Take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. Then the commander came and said, Tell me, you're a Roman? They tell me you're a Roman. He said, Yeah. And the commander answered, With a large sum of money, I obtained my citizenship. How about you? Paul said, I was born a citizen. Immediately, those who were about to examine him withdrew from him. And the commander, who was afraid after he found out he was a Roman, because they had bound him. The next day, they wanted to know for certain why he was accused. He was released from his bonds, uh, yada, yada, yada. So, so now he's basically arrested, and he's going to await a trial. So the Romans, right, the occupying foreign colonial power that, is, that has uh, the Jews under their thumb, right, are under the same kind of predicament they had with Jesus, right? This is a kind of a religious squabble the Jews are having. And, you know, what do you want us to do with Jesus? Uh, Set for us free! Crucify Jesus! So they kind of wash their hands and they say, Oy vey, okay. I don't think the Romans would say, Oy vey. So now they have uh, Paul, right? And, you know, this is another religious squabble. So, you know, what are we supposed to do with this guy? Let's, let's send him first to uh, the high priest and that council of rabbis and see if they can work things out. And maybe the Romans can just, you know, escape another scandal by crucifying somebody who might be innocent. So let's go to chapter uh, 23, right? So Paul is now before a uh, council of religious elders. And he says to them, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. So the high priest... All Paul says is, hey, I, you know, I've, I've lived a good life. I've obeyed God. And the high priest commands that he gets struck on the mouth, right? Nice guy. And then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall, for you sit to judge me according to the law. And, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? And those who stood by said, do you revile God's high priest? Then Paul said, hmm? I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people. So you got to remember, Paul's been away for a long time. Remember, even the, the locals didn't even know him by face. Uh, they just knew him by reputation. So he 
hadn't been keeping up to date. There was no Facebook back then, right? He comes back. He doesn't recognize all these people. He doesn't know who's who. All of a sudden, he's arrested and he's thrown into this room and he's being persecuted. And he says, hey, I did nothing wrong. Boom, they punch him in the mouth. And he just reacts like, you know, what's up with that? So when Paul perceived that one part of the people in the room were Sadducees and the other part were Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men, brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead. I am being judged. So he knows, he knows this is going to cause a division in the ranks, right? It's like Calvinists and non-Calvinists in the room. And he starts, he just does this mic drop to try to get those guys to squabble against each other, right? So he drops this perfect line. And when he said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisee confesses both. Then there arose a loud outcry, and the scribes of the Pharisees, uh, they arose and they protested, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel had spoken to him, let us not fight against groves. So they, they cause this great division. So that Rome had devolved into such a crazy argument and frenzy that the Romans you know, looked at like, hey man, they're going to tear this guy Paul limb by limb. So they seized Paul and they put him in jail, pretty much for his own safety. And then word got out that there were a bunch of Jews who said they weren't even going to eat. They took his vow to not even eat until they killed uh, Paul. So I think in the middle of the night, they, they moved him to a more secure location in Caesarea. And he basically was a prisoner there for two years. You know, this is a guy who was going around spreading the gospel of Christ, right? And, and look at how he's being treated. Beaten, uh, scourged, imprisoned, in chains. And this is not even to... to we're going to talk a little bit later on about what he went through while he was on these, these three journeys. So uh, another Roman shows up, Festus. Uh, and he's looking at this situation and he kind of wants to do the Jews a favor to, you know, cement a little peace in the, in the region and, 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 and gain favor on him. Because if you keep the people happy, they're easier to control. So there he's thinking about turning Paul back over to the Jews. And so we're going to pick it up at this point in uh, Acts chapter uh, 25. Festus, wanting to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged before me concerning these things? So Paul said, uh, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you very well know. For if I am an offender or have committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying. But if there is nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver them to me. I appeal to Caesar. Once a Roman citizen appeals to Caesar, boom, they have that right to be transported to Rome and you wait until you get to a hearing in front of Caesar. And that could be a decade. That's the decision you make. You're better off sometimes dealing with the local authorities and just doing your time and getting out and being a free man. But, but Paul appealed to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had confirmed with the council, answered, You have appealed to Caesar? To Caesar you shall go. And they put him on that ship and then there's a, this tempest in the water and they're, they're ready, to, ready to throw everybody overboard. And Paul's like chill bro chill you know and i think that that's when they land on some island and the snake bites him and he doesn't die and all these things happen and they finally get him into a prison uh in rome and he is there for two more years so what i'm going to do between the time of his death where, where his fate is sealed in rome we're going to discuss some of the um, tribulations that he went through in his life. You know, this, this, this great man of God and, and, and the tribulations that God allowed him to go through. So now I'm, I'm going to 
step back a little bit and we're going to talk about a letter that uh, where, where Paul is writing to the Corinthians and, and just a small little portion where he's talking about some of the persecution that they have gone through in their, in their journey with Christ to, uh, to preach the gospel. So in 1 Corinthians 4, right, um, verse 9, For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles last, as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both the angels and of men. So yeah, there were parts of their journey where they were condemned to death. They were attempted to be stoned. People wanted to kill them. They were being uh, mocked by the world for being Christians. Verse 10, for we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. So that's the world mocking them, mocking them, mocking them, just like day and age that we live in now. To the present hour, we are both Hunger. We both hunger and thirst. We are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. This doesn't strike me as the Lord heaping all his blessings upon the second greatest man, in my opinion, who ever walked the face of the earth. This guy is going out there. He's preaching the gospel. And this is how the world is reacting to it. To this present hour, we both hunger and thirst. We are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands, being reviled we bless, being persecuted we endure, being defamed we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things until now. So this totally uh, flies in the face of this uh, health and wealth prosperity gospel not that there's anything wrong with, uh, you know, obtaining uh, money to, to, to live in some semblance of comfort. So Paul is continuing his preaching to the Corinthians, and he's imploring them not to fall away, not to be deceived. In Corinthians 2, chapter 11, verse 3, I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For he who comes preaching another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit of which you have not received, or a different gospel of which you have not accepted, that you may you might put up with it. So so he's he's warning them of people that come along and preach a different, uh, you know, they, they deviate from the gospel message. It, it's a false teacher, right? For And it says here, no wonder, and 14, even Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. So beware the wolves in sheep's clothing. But Paul now is going to describe some of the other tribulations that he has gone through in his life. Uh, I, I always like to back up a verse and then read into what, I, uh, what I'm going to read here. Uh, verse 23, Are they not ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant, in stripes, above measure, in prisons, more frequently, frequently, in deaths, often. This guy has been whipped, thrown in jail, had his life threatened. In verse 24, From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes. Minus one. Because people sometimes would die. Like maybe one time, one time somebody set a precedent. And on that 40th uh, stripe, 40th time he was whipped, he died. So they said, oh, give him 40 minus one. We're going to beat him to the brink of death. Five times this happened to Paul by his own people. Three times I was beaten with rods. That would be the Romans. That was one of their methods of punishment. So five times he was, he was hit uh, with the stripes. 39 minus 1. Hold on a second. Thirty-nine times five equals a hundred and ninety-five scars on Paul's back from the Jews. He was whipped. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. 
He was in the ocean, holding onto a log, all night, all day, waiting to be rescued, lost at sea, in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Everywhere he went, his life was in peril from the people who, from the highwaymen, right? Who, you know, he's walking from city to city in his 10,000 mile truck. Robbers are going after him. Gentiles wanted to kill him. And he's in the sea, he almost lost his life. From false Christians, right? False brethren, he was being attacked. In weariness and toil, in sleeplessness, often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings, often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily. Yeah, all this and more, besides all the other things, these my deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble, and I do not burn with indignation? For if I boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. So yeah, if I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in my infirmity. So, so in my weakness, I am strong. When, when man is in his weakest position, that's when they cry out to God, right? Remember after 9-11, all of a sudden, everybody wanted to go to church, right? That's who people turn to. So, how is this blessed life that Paul, the second greatest God, is doing everything that the Lord asks him to do? And all these things are happening to him. It's a tough dude, man. It's a tough dude. And then he says, you know what? I'll go talk to Caesar. So he goes to Rome. And in that two years where he was in prison, he was actually under a house arrest and he was able to hold court. And there were already there was already a Christian community in Rome by the time Paul showed up. And they must have been, yeah, Paul's here. So every day he was able to preach and educate the people by taking the gospels of the old, the, the, the scrolls of the Old Testament and explaining to him how Jesus fulfilled all of these things from the book of Daniel to the book of Isaiah and um, Jeremiah and Micah. And it and they were able to solidify their faith. Unfortunately, you know, soon after that, uh, the Christians were being murdered. Like after the great fire, uh, they the Christians were being murdered left and right. So at the end of this uh, sad story of a great man, Paul's under house arrest in Rome, holding court with, with Christians and and witnessing to, to guards and Romans and Gentiles and Jews. And unfortunately, he has to appeal to Nero, who after Nero killed his mom, Agrippa, he kind of let loose his craziness and turned into this kind of Oscar Wilde-esque character, just sleeping with... He slept with his male slave. He slept with... Uh, he married a young boy try to turn that young boy into a woman, just a complete sexual deviant. And, and then he had that great fire. And what do, what do uh, people do when you know, they want to divert attention away from the government? Uh, you go after the Jews, right? Or you go after the Christians. Or, you, or like in the Arab countries, when their economy is so bad, it's the Jews' fault. It's the, uh, the great evil, it's the great Satan's fault, right? So Nero just said, okay, I'm just going to blame the Christians. So he started burning Christians alive. I think he would dip them in, in tar and light them alive and use them as torches to light the city at nighttime. And this was the time when, when uh, here's Paul waiting to have, hold court with Caesar, looking around like, what? And uh, so they had him decapitated. Had him decapitated. Nero, who ultimately did the world a favor and committed suicide. So that's the life of Paul. Everything that bad that could have happened to him pretty much happened to him 
whipped and beaten to the verge of death, robbed, poor. He was a tent maker. He, he, he was able to, to fund these mission trips. He's a self-made man. But uh, yeah, he didn't live a life of luxury. He didn't live a life of, uh, of great health. Uh, he even had that uh, thing in his hip, right? Hold on a second. Yeah, the famous thorn in the flesh, right? Uh, let's go 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a message, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Man, that sounds so upside down, right? When I am weak, I am weak, right? No, when I am weak, I am strong. Right there, I mean, let's read this red letter again. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Again, that flies in the face of some of these people who, who, who to say that you should be wealthy, you should be healthy, you are sick because you are a sinner. You know what? I don't know about all that stuff. I don't want to go into this theological battle. I'm just telling you, Paul's life wasn't all, you know, nice smelling roses and perfect health and wealth. He was a hardworking man. He was a Pharisee. He gave away all that life he could have lived. You know, been all puffed up and, and praying on the streets in, in Jerusalem, thanking the Lord that I'm not like that lowly sinner over there. No. He called himself the chief of all sinners. And he, and he repented and he went out and he preached the gospel. And, and he gave away a life of luxury and he lived a life of, of misery, of, of out in the elements, sleeping in tents, homeless, ragged clothes, preaching the word of God with a limp for 10,000 miles. So, you know, I, I thank God for good health. You know, I pray that I pray for good health. But like I told you before, in that moment when I was super, super sick, I felt the closest to God I had ever felt. And maybe there's something to that. I don't know, but, but just, I don't even know how to wrap it up. I'm just, just telling you that when you hear a different message, just prepare yourself. Or do you just say, look, if somebody tells you you should be rich and, <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and you shouldn't be sick, just remind them of how Paul lived and what Paul went through and how great of a man Paul was. And I'm pretty sure Paul's in heaven right now. <laughs> okay, So hope you enjoyed this little walk, uh, this little journey through the first century and the life of uh, what it was like for Paul. Small Paul, the apostle, one of the greatest men who ever lived. So thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. And I'll catch you next time. Take care. Thanks. Bye.